Hey there, welcome to the Crushing Defeat Podcast. My name is Blake Richards. With me is Dan Burrington. Hello. And today we are going to be talking about body hacking or what those in the know like to call bio hacking. So from here out for the rest of the show, we are going to be calling it bio hacking. Does that sound fair, Dan? Fair enough. All right, good. We are going to talk a little bit about bio hacking first and the history of humans altering their bodies for various reasons. We're also going to talk about the types of biohacks and where today you can get these things where you can purchase implants to hack yourself. We're also going to talk about the business of biohacking and where the money does currently and where it could come from. This could become a multi, multi multi-billion dollar industry in many ways it already is if you look at medical implants. And we're going to talk about some of the concerns, some of the social concerns regarding biohacking, whether it refers to choice, privacy, that type of thing, and and also how it relates a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about how it relates to religion. And then last but certainly not least, we're going to pose some questions to you out there to see what your thoughts are on biohacking and what we discussed today. Does that sound like a plan, Dan? Indeed. All right. Very good. So first, we want to offer up a little bit of a disclaimer and... Do not subject yourself to body modification if you don't know what you're doing. It can lead to loss of the use of parts of your body and even death in the worst of circumstances. So you heard it here. Don't do this. Yeah. Everything we're talking about, you really don't want to do unless you want to, but you really don't. Now, honestly, Dan, the more we talk about this subject, the more I actually want a biohack. I'm thinking my preferred would be the RFID chip that we'll talk about that goes in between the thumb and the index finger. Mm -hmm. In Mm -hmm. fact, when I was on my way here to the Crushing Defeat studio for us to record today, before you got here, I passed by a tattoo and piercing place on Division Yeah, here in Grand Rapids, and I'm wondering if they would do the implant for me. Is that the one that you want to go to, the one that you found on Division Vision. in Grand Rapids? Maybe. Like I said, you should just let me do it, and we'll do it live, pre-recorded on the podcast for the listeners at home. Mm-hmm. Pre-recorded from the cloud. Go uh, send an email from. to info at crushingdefeat.com. If we get three people total that say we would like Blake to do this live on the podcast, I'll do it. I'm down for that. I'm going to set the number a little higher. I'm going to set the number double digits. So if we get 10 people to go to what site, Dan, where do they go? They can go to crushingdefeat.com or they can send us an email at info at crushingdefeat.com. So if we get double digit people to do it, we will set up to record myself getting an RFID implant into my body, into my hand, and we will record that for your listening pleasure. So I'm down for that. Double digits, double digit people to speak up. Um, but let's let's get back to our itinerary here, if you will. I want to talk a little bit about the history of biohacking, you know, where we've come from, where we're going. And Dan, you have some pretty interesting, because biohacking can be lots of things, right? It can be stuff that you do to yourself, implants, or it can be stuff that the medical community does, or it can be just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but more external type things or, or more practices or behaviors that you do to alter your body. Yeah, a lot of biohacks that we've had commonplace, made commonplace, are just things that alter the way that we perceive the world and we don't really think about them. But you can go back to you know the pirate days, like actual pirates. And a lot of pirates did wear eye patches, but they wore eye patches to get themselves ready for night vision to improve their night vision. So if they starve their eye of light, they could keep their pupils open longer and thus have better night vision. And then you move a little bit more forward in time and you had eyeglasses and a lot of people still use eyeglasses. That is kind of a biohack. Regarding the history of biohacking, really up until recent history, the majority of it has been medical based. It really hasn't been designed to enhance the senses or abilities of people. It's really been more to fix stuff that is broken, except for the pirate example, Dan, that you gave, which is a way to enhance 
things, but the majority of what we've seen in history up until, you know, a few years ago or not that long ago, in recent history, what we've seen has been more medically based to fix things, including about half a century ago, Swedish, Swedish meatballs, Swedish scientists, not meatballs, created and developed the first pacemaker. So about half a century ago, we had the first pacemaker go into someone's body to set the pace for their heart. So really the first biohacks were implants. 1800s, going back a little bit further, 1800s in the history of biohacking, there was arthroplasty. Arthroplasty is bone joints. So way back in the 1800s, they would biohack themselves or doctors would biohack people and they would insert artificial materials to act as the bone joint for discs. They would use wax, glass, rubber, all kinds of different things until they found materials that the body wouldn't reject. So it's another little tidbit of the history of biohacking. If you get to more recent times, we've had Google Glass, which is kind of like Geordie LaForge on Star Trek. It was an overlay that you'd be able to see inside your glasses. It didn't go over extremely well, uh, but it's a step in the direction. There's a gentleman by the name of Neil Harbison, colorblind. He's completely colorblind to the point where he sees the world nearly in black and white. Mm -hmm. And he has a camera strapped onto his head. It kind of hangs over his forehead like an anglerfish. And uh, it gives different pitches as he looks at different things. So every color has a corresponding pitch. And that's how he sees the world. So as he moves through and he looks at green, if he goes from green to a lighter shade, the pitch will change slightly. But if he goes from dark green to bright red, it'll change altogether. And he's actually an artist. Like he works in color based off of these pitches that he can hear. What's interesting about Neil is if you listen to one of the interviews with him, he describes how people have reacted to this device. And it looks quite strange, if I'm being honest. It looks like... Um, I'd be off put. If you walked yeah. in and you had one on your head I'd, I, and I didn't know you, I probably wouldn't want to talk to you about it. So let's see if we can describe this so that the listeners out there can picture this in their mind's eye. So basically he has a long silver metal, almost like a cable, but it's a cable that's strong enough to be shaped. And it comes out the back of his skull and it curves, it follows the curvature of his head all the way up and down and almost, it's, it's like in front of his forehead. And it's, if I remember right, it's like right in the middle. Yeah. And it, so it curves around the back of his skull and it, and it follows the shape of his head at about an inch, inch and a half, two inches away. And it follows the curve of his head. And then this little camera look, the camera device sits like right in front of his forehead. But one of the things he describes is how over time people have changed how they react to what he has. So you mentioned Google Glass, and I think it's things like that that have in the cameras, the body cams that police officers are starting to wear and things like that, where people are on the lookout for cameras on individuals. And that's what everyone seems to think it is now is a camera recording them. And that's, and that's their concern before they thought it was, it was different stuff. He said a few years ago, everyone thought it was a phone. You know, everyone thought it was like a Bluetooth type setup for his phone. The worst Bluetooth setup ever. Yeah. Yeah. And now they, now they think it's a camera. So it's, it's interesting how opinions have changed. I thought that was kind of neat when he was describing that, but let's talk, let's talk now about the different types of biohacks. And we've put these into a few different categories to help everyone kind of understand what's out there and, and try and make sense of biohacking because it can get quite complex. So there are passive and active types of biohacks. An active biohack is something that you interact with and that does things. So if you had a camera for a false eye, that would be active. A passive would be something like an atheroplasty where it's an implant in your bone joint, but it doesn't actively do anything other than be there and serve its purpose. So we've got passive and active biohacks. Then we have really internal and external. So you've got the biohacks that go in your body, the implants, and then you have the biohacks really, you know, if you're wearing a smartwatch and it's checking your heart rate, that's, that's sort of a biohack. 
but it's an external one. Yeah. Neil Harbison's device could really be both because there's a part that actually is attached inside to his skull. And then there's this external piece that comes over top. But you've got really over the, um, the majority of them are either fully internal or external. Then you have medical, which has been the most prevalent up until now. You have medical biohacks, the pacemakers, the implants, the things of that nature. And then you have, uh, I don't know, like, like, Batman's utility belt. So they're really utility type biohacks where, you know, you've got chips in your hands or the thing that Neil Harbison's got. So yeah, those you are, don't need it to survive and it doesn't necessarily help you act like a normal human being. You're trying to become more than human as a result of this biohack. I so wish we could get the rights for Rob Zombie's more human than human. I don't think we can even say the name of the song now. We're gonna get sued. Probably, we probably will, and that's too bad. But everyone out there, imagine you're hearing that more human than human. You can't even hear that. Rob Zombie, if you're listening to this, I'm a big fan. Please don't sue us. Please don't. We have zero dollars, no money, so do not sue us. All right. Uh, So those are some different types or categories of biohacks. And some different ones that exist today that are out there. Let's, Let's talk through that. One that was mentioned a little bit earlier and and probably one of the most popular utility type internal biohacks right now and one of the ones that's causing the most controversy in some circles is the RFID implant. It's a small, about the size of of a large grain of rice, radio frequency identification chip and it typically gets implanted in between your thumb and your pointer finger in that fleshy part of your hand. And you can use this to interact with doors, unlock your computer, unlock your phone. It's really designed for sending small little bits of information. So how are people using these RFID chips? Well, a company in Sweden that is offering this to their employees, it acts as their employee badge, if you will, and it unlocks doors. It allows them access to their copy machine and things of that nature. And they're offering this if their employees are interested in having it done. They're not requiring it. I know that's a big concern for people out there, and we'll get to that in a bit. Another example of what people are using RFID chips for is to turn off alarm systems. So if you have an alarm system in your house, you can walk in and scan your hand and it shuts that off. You also have Amo Grafstra who is known for being the owner of DangerousThings.com, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But he uses his RFID chip to start and unlock his vehicle, which is pretty handy. So you've got this small grain of rice in your hand that replaces your whole ring of keys. And this is the one, quite frankly, quite honestly, Dan, that I'm interested in getting at this point. We've spent so much time looking at this biohacking tech, and I've seen the different kinds, and there's really not a ton out there when it comes to the more utility type biohacks, but this one is quite interesting to me and I could see myself using it to unlock my phone, unlock my door, start my car, all of these types of things. And in fact, I think a great use of it would be, uh, and this, this is out there too, to unlock like a gun cabinet or a gun case. So rather than having, you know, a three digit code that your kids could figure out or a key that they could find somewhere in the house, you've got this biohack that re- would require the parent in order to open up the gun case. Where some people get confused here is it's it doesn't connect directly to the internet. It doesn't have GPS. Yeah, it's short range. It's very yeah. short range uh, radio signal. It's basically like a, a key. Like it carries a signal of X, and that signal, when it connects to something else, does whatever you have it pre-programmed to do. Yep, absolutely. I think a key is a great way to describe it. And one of the things I think would be cool is if you had a way to share your business card via this RFID chip. So we do a fist bump, right? And Uh it transfers our business cards back and forth. So would I know that this was happening? Like, would my hand vibrate if we both had this thing? Yeah, it would have to have some feedback. It would be sweet, though. It would be expected. We would know. What if we were just at the bar and we didn't know each other and the Lions scored, you know, their fifth touchdown? Yep. Which happens. Yeah. You know, it does. And we were just like random dudes. Hey, fist bump. Our hands vibrate. I don't know what you just gave me. 
It could be a business card. It could be mm -hmm. a naked picture of you. I would hope not. That's why we would high five instead. Okay. So it, this would have to, be, there would be some international norms and mores that would you, come out of this. You actually made a really good point about that earlier, though, that this RFID, while it sounds cool, there is no standard for this. There's no biohacking standard for RFID. So if Sony comes out with Betamax RFID and everybody else wants to use VHS RFID and you install it in your body, a year down the road, mm -hmm. it could be obsolete. It could be. And that is definitely a concern anytime you are installing something into your body. However, the good news is, although it is invasive, they can be replaced. So you can have it taken out and another one put back in. Much like, so another biohack that we haven't talked about, but breast implants are really a biohack. It's a cosmetic one, or you could even go as far to say utility biohack. Yeah, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, exactly. But it's a biohack, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry, and some women get them done multiple, multiple times. So, yeah, I don't think they're good forever. I, I think that there's some maintenance that you got to take care of on those things. Every once in a while, they have to be re implanted. So it'd be the same thing and actually much less invasive to have an RFID, RFID. It would be much less invasive to much have an RFID yes. chip <laughs> exchange changed out than a breast implant. So some other types that of biohacks that are being used, one is magnets and people are putting magnets into the tips of their fingers. And what this does is it creates a pseudo sixth sense where you can feel magnetic fields, you can feel power lines, and it gives you a type of feedback in your fingertips. And you can also pick up small things like paper clips. I saw one video of a guy, he was in, a, in the middle of the street, well, on like the sidewalk, and he's rubbing his hand around the ground to see if he picks up anything metal. And sure enough, he pulls his hand away and there's- A syringe. Um, yeah, right? Little, <laughs> a dirty ass syringe. That would that be terrible. And it's bleeding. Ah, I just got the hiv. Anyway, there were metal bits that he just randomly picked up. Yeah. But it's, it's a powerful magnet. It's a neodymium yeah. magnet. You've got it inside your finger and just these subtle vibrations, these subtle oscillations that the magnet does because it's sensing these fields. You wouldn't be able to notice this if it was in the palm of your hand, but since it's inside your finger, you notice these subtle oscillations and you can actually feel fields. I, I read an article where the guy was saying that when he would come up to his computer, he could actually feel the computer fan going off on the rear of the unit. So I, I think that's cool, but when we're talking about active things, this is definitely an active thing because this is something that you cannot turn off. You're going to be feeling this all the time. So once it's in you, and I guess that's the same with all of these things. I mean, once it's in you, it's in you. Mm -hmm. What I expect is at some point in the near future, these biohacks will become much more of a normal thing. And you could even see 20 years from now, a home repair man or a remodel person or a construction person getting magnets implanted into their fingertips just so that they could feel where the power lines are behind walls or where the nails and screws are in a stud and be able to feel that. It's like a biohacked stud finder and you wouldn't need to have any extra tools. And these biohacks are going to become so commonplace where that won't be a big thing. You'll just have it in your hand and just wipe it across the wall. I mean, it could get to the point where it's ubiquitous and it's, you know, you're a journeyman electrician and you go in for a job interview and they're like, oh, you've got a, uh, you know, a finger magnet. No, no, I never got one. Oh, we'll take care of that for you. And mm -hmm. they set you up with a biohack. I could see that happening in like 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really not that far off for something like that to become commonplace. And we have an invention that we're going to make millions of dollars off. So Dan, one of the things you brought up was whether or not you could turn it on or off. I mean, it would be kind of a pain, honestly, to always have this going on. So we're going to come up with like rubber or plastic fingertips that you can put over your fingers to essentially deactivate that magnet. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like an on-off switch. So you take the fingertip off, and then you can use the magnet to find the power lines in the walls, and then you put the fingertip back on, and not only could they come in different colors and styles, but they're also quite you know, utilitarian. They're also quite effective. Yeah, they're only 300 bucks at crushingdefeat.com. You can get it in neon pink or green. Those are the two colors yeah. that we chose. Or camo. It sounds weird. They look the best on one's fingers. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're, we're going with. 300 bucks, easy installments. Yeah, absolutely. It's true, though. I mean, all joking aside, it is something that a lot of us jump into. Like, you have tattoos. I have tattoos. I don't regret my tattoos, but... I know some people that got tattoos and they regret them. These are a little bit more reversible, but at the same time, like if it was a little hard pounding to get it put in, it's going to be a little hard pounding to get the thing taken out. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the magnets are, are a fairly popular biohack that you see on a lot of the sites out there to, that sell them. Um, the other thing that you talked about is the whole eyes piece. And you talked a lot about the biohacking of the eyes. And there's this guy, his name is Gabe. Lacina and he put this liquid into his eyes that gave him night vision. So Gabriel Lacina, he used chlorine C6 and it's a chemical found in deep sea fish. And he literally had this stuff injected right next to his tear duct. Uh, he's a engineer. A, I mean, he's not a wacko doing this. They injected this stuff on top of his eye into his tear duct so it would go back around his eye and onto his retina. And he was able to see in very, very low light vision for something like 160 feet is yeah. how far he could see in almost clear darkness, clear darkness, in almost total darkness. Again, it's somewhat subjective because he's the only guy that did it and he's the only guy that can say, yeah, it worked. Right. And uh, there's ophthalmologists that are saying, yeah, don't put this stuff in yeah, your don't eyes do it. because it can make you go blind or it could make your retina swell and detach. So well, don't I'll tell do you, it. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing. If you look at the pictures on the internet of him, it looks like in movies where you see actors put in the contact lenses that make their eyes completely black. Oh, yeah. Yeah, his eye was all black. Yeah, it was really creepy and alien there's another type of biohack out there that's called Energy Addicts. And it was created by an Israeli named Naomi Kisner. And basically, this jewelry goes into your veins. And then, so you, you figure it like stabs into your vein on one end, then there's the piece of jewelry, and then it stabs into your vein on the other end. And it actually uses your blood flow to spin a little circle, a little conductor that creates energy. So the blood flow is converted into energy. So there's this jewelry and it causes this little golden wheel to spin. Uh, and it's, the thought is that someday we're going to be able to use biohacking to have your body power your phone. So instead of having to worry about batteries, it will be a physiological energy that we use to power your phone, which if you think about the phones of the future just being something in your ear or that type of thing, that, that meshes quite well. But you can get a, a couple different types of this, what's called vein jewelry by Energy Addicts. You can get a piece that goes in between your eyes. There's a piece that goes on your wrist. So right now it just... It's just a wheel that spins. It doesn't power anything. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Okay. It's it's just an energy creation, you know, device right now. But then there's another one that it shows on your on the spine. And I'm sure there's a ton of blood flow back there where you know that's the type of stuff that you could use to power your phone. I know probably people out there are cringing at the thought of it. Well, that'd be like, I mean, a very grotesque hydroelectric dam, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's a blood flow hydroelectric dam that someday... A hemioelectric dam. I just came up with that word. I coined it. That's my word. Yeah, there you go. That one day could power your phone. How crazy is that? So let's, Dan, let's talk about where people can get biohacks. Because this is stuff you can buy today, right now, if you go onto the internet. And you search biohacks. What comes up? 
dangerousthings.com is a very prevalent place where you can get biohacks. They've sold thousands and thousands of RFID chips. They also have the magnets that you can get. It's a one-stop shop. You can get the gloves and the lidocaine and the install kit, a needle, a thick needle, and you put the RFID chip in the tip of it and you stick the needle into your hand and then bloop, you just pop the chip right in there. And the individuals that are doing this most are the piercers. So the same place where you would go to get your belly button pierced, the same place you would go to get your tattoos done is are the places where more often than not people are going to get these biohacks. Because here's where kind of the legalese comes in as far as where you can go to get this stuff. Dan, you can do whatever you want to yourself. Right. You could put, I don't know, whatever you want. You could put whatever you want into your own body. That is your choice. Where it becomes an issue is people doing it to each other. I'll be right back. I'm going to go get a bowling pin. Yeah, exactly. You could put that right in your wherever. Your armpit. Yeah, armpit. That's what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. How did you know? But yeah, you can do it to yourself. You just can't do it to other people. So some states I know are different than others. You definitely want to know if this is something you even remotely consider, which again, we are recommending you do not. But if this is something that you even remotely consider, you want to check, make sure you understand the legalese in the state or country that you're in. But on DangerousThings.com, they actually have a map that you can go and find places that do this. Now, I looked it up for us and the closest places that are on that are listed at least are in Minnesota and I believe there was another one like in Indiana or Illinois, someplace south of us. I think that goes to the point that it's going to be based on local law, so my guess is in Michigan it's not legal for a piercer to do this sort of thing. And again, we're not telling anybody not to do this, but anytime you do something like this, make sure that you educate yourself. Listening to this podcast is a start, but if you want to put something in your body, research it greatly. Make sure that you know all of the facts. Make sure that if you do get somebody to do it for you, that they know what they're doing and they they have done it before. That's all we're saying. So dangerousthings.com tends to be the biggest site out there as far as the implants, but you also have sites like upgradedself.com where you can go and they have a lot of external type of hacking things. So you mentioned pirates using eye patches to strengthen their eyesight. There you can go and get things like lung strengtheners or different things to really just kind of test your metal and and you know biohack yourself from a self-improvement standpoint but anyway that's upgraded self.com um, so those are a couple of sites there's also biohack.me uh, biohack.me which is where you can go and that's a site for you know the grinder community and for the people that are really into biohacking so those are a few places that you can go and get these things today which is pretty crazy so talking about biohack from a business standpoint, Dan, there's obviously the business of the equipment, right? There's purchasing, buying, manufacturing, selling the actual equipment. And an example of this right now, the wearable industry is a $3.4 billion industry. It's a lot of schmeckles. That is, that is a lot of lettuce. Now, this includes Bluetooth headsets, which make... You know, they sell a lot each year. Yeah, that's huge. Headphones are big. That's another thing that's going to fall into that. Yep. Uh, Wearables as a whole, it goes to the extension of where cell phones have gone. Cell phones started out as a easy way to stay in communication with your family. And then they kind of progressed to be your lifeline to basically social media at this point. And I could see wearables and implants doing something similar. Yeah, absolutely. So again, $3.4 billion for all those smart watches and Bluetooth headsets and things like that that are going out there. And Dan, you mentioned Google Glass. What in the world happened to Google Glass? I think it was more of a scientific experiment and to see what they could do with it. I think they accomplished their goal. People were off put by it. It was very obvious that you had something on the side of your face. People didn't know if they were being recorded. Uh, it was it was socially looked down upon, I guess. Mm-hmm. People called them glass holes. And I could get that. Like somebody sits across from you and they've got this thing strapped to their head and you're trying to have a conversation with them. It's like, 
can't you just look at me instead of using this piece of technology to observe me and record our conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So I thought this was going to take off. I thought Google Glass would become a, a thing and it would be a big part of that $3.4 billion wearable industry because the whole concept was, you know, an altered visual reality where you could see like a HUD you know, that was kind of the original, I thought, like where you could see if I looked at a, a building and it was a business, I could see their promotion or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went to where there where there weren't lenses in the ones that you see now. It's just. Yeah, it's like just a camera. tiny window up in the corner. So yeah. you have to look up into the corner to see. And the idea behind that was so that you weren't obstructing your sight. Mm -hmm. So if you're driving down the road and your wife text messages you, you don't go off the road. I thought I wanted one and I signed up for the beta, if you will. And it was like $1,500. So I did not, but I don't know. I, I think you're right. I think people were really concerned about others walking around recording everything around them all the time. And that kind of put the kibosh on the momentum that Google Glass had. But there was a while there where it seemed like it was going to be a big thing. I'll tell you when it's going to take off. When it's, uh, there's a, speaking of Google, there's a company now called Verily. So Google is now, I'm going to make this quick. Google is now Alphabet, that's the parent company that owns Google. And there's all of these smaller companies under the Alphabet umbrella now. And Verily is one of these companies and it's the life sciences division that they're running under. And they're doing things like making contact lenses that read a person's blood sugar. So for like a diabetic, this contact lens would read your blood sugar and then send a message to your smartphone if you were low or if you were high. And you look at that and you're thinking, why would Google get into this? And part of it is they want to be a good company, I'm sure. But that is huge money because now you've tapped into this piece of information that's extremely valuable. It's valuable to the consumer because they want to know, you know, am I healthy? Is my blood sugar in the right range? It's important to their doctor so that their doctor knows that they're maintaining a healthy diet. It's important for the science, uh, scientists involved in this as a whole. So people that are actually making drugs for diabetics say, hey, if I'm somebody that makes a long at lasting insulin, could you get me information based on 35 year old to 40 year old males and their blood sugars from three o'clock until midnight? Mm -hmm. That sounds innocuous. It sounds like a silly piece of data, but that could save them $200,000 rather than having to do their own study. If they could just get that information straight from Google, that's when you're going to start to see things like this really, really take off because everything that we've seen, cell phones are subsidized, not as much anymore, but right. they always have. And that's how they got into the market. Nobody wanted to spend $500 on a smartphone, but they'd spend 150, they'd spend 200 bucks. That's what's going to happen with these glucose lenses, something that costs $25 for one lens. Well, you can get it for five dollars for one lens and it'll last you a month. People will do that. Yeah. And so there's you mentioned a, a, another piece of the business, which is the big data that comes from biohacking. If you think about it, why Facebook is a thing is because of big data. Why that exists as an organization isn't any more so that you can share information and pictures with your friends. That's what it does. But the reason it exists is big data and ultimately an advertising delivery system. Yeah. But imagine a world where now companies can know if they put an image in front of you that your heart rate goes up and that your pupils dilate and that your body temperature increases so they know without a doubt that that image or that advertisement had an impact on you. That is crazy. And I'm sure there are some business financial wizards around somewhere that are just salivating to get a hold of this type of big data. And that is really the future of, uh, of biohacking is that eventually it's going to become not only a, this huge business regarding the equipment, but also the data mining that can happen is, is just unreal, unprecedented. And then you're going to have to explain to your girlfriend why your spam folder is filled with furry porn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Every because time he looks at somebody in a uh, animal costume, his eyes dilate. Let's let's send this boy some more animal porn. Right. Exactly. And you can't get a, you can't escape it. However, you know it's the people like this that are putting themselves out there. Whether it's Gabe or Rob Spence. Rob Spence has uh, a missing eye, and on the Showtime show about biohacking. Um, they've got a show called Darknet and he has created a camera 
that he puts into his false eye. So you talk about Google Glass recording you. Now you've got to also worry about people, if you're worried about this type of thing, I'm really not, but you've also got to worry about people having false eyes that can record you. So Steve Hayworth from grindhousewetworks.com is, is Steve's site. He had this huge implant put into his arm under his tattoo. I think it was like three inches long. Yeah, it looks like somebody used rope to tie it off. Yeah. It does not look like a medical job done well. It was actually Tim Cannon that did that for him. But anyway, so yeah, he had his he had his buddy Tim implant this huge thing into his arm. And it's again, it's what would you say? You got pictures, it's like four inches long and probably like a half inch thick, and it sticks out from his Yeah, arm, I mean it's like it's half, not like it's not inch. concealed at all. Yeah. It is my understanding that it's basically like a little Arduino hard drive. It just reads his body temperature. That's it? That's it. That's the only thing that this huge and implant he has is it ran, It regularly pings and sends body temperature data. Did he just set it up for like a mega battery to last a really long time? Well, that's or? what's funny is if you watch, the battery went, went down on him like super fast. So now he's trying to hobble together wireless charging for this thing in his arm and he's showing he can show you where it'll take the charge but i haven't seen that if he's gotten it charged back up or not but yeah man that's that's what people are doing to to pioneer this new thing this biohacking putting huge implants into their arm just to read body temperature stats that's it it doesn't, and, and that's crazy to me that you would need such a big piece of hardware to do that. But. I don't think you would need to do that, but if you were just cobbling pieces together. Doing it yourself, yeah. Like he just, he took the beta product and he was like, well, I guess this is it. This right. is going in me. Yep. Dude, that thing's like a foot long. I don't care. I does, want it in me right now. It does not matter. Do I it. need to know my temperature at all times. Yeah, pretty crazy, pretty crazy. But eventually, you'll be able to get something RFID chip size, and it'll be your phone, your wallet, your keys. All thanks to Steve. Yeah, all because, thanks to Steve, exactly. Some actual legit engineer is going to look at that and say, oh, man, why'd you do that to yourself? Right. I'll spend three and a half minutes and design something that isn't the size of, like, a wallet. Yeah, it's a thermistor device to check temperature. Pretty crazy stuff. And it's neat because it would show you know, random checks of the body temperature and it would send to this list, but it almost looked like a, like an MS DOS program. Yeah. And it was just a long list of body temperature checks, which is pretty. Yeah. If you're going that big, I mean, why not get a nice interface if it's going to be this, you know, hockey puck that you put inside your arm? Yeah. Yeah. But the, the future of this is to have wireless charging, you know, Planned wireless charging will help a ton. Yeah. Because then you don't, the battery, you don't have to worry about as much. But you, you also have to be careful that the battery doesn't get too warm when it charges because it is inside in you. your body. Yeah. Um, and also, versions in, in the near future are going to have, you know, better Android access and access to do network type things where it'll send you a text message if your body reaches a certain temperature. So, his thought is not only can he randomly have body temperature checks but it can also warn him if he's about to get the flu is, okay is the concept as well and you know that's something that could be eventually helpful for people yeah it's all biometrics if you get to a certain point and your body fluctuates from its normal stat whatever that might be if it's a blood pressure or temperature or your heart rate and you're you know you've been taking all this information from your body for the last six months, it knows that there's a big deviation there. Right. It can alert your doctor and say, Hey, you know, Dan's blood pressure has been up for the last 24 hours. So we're talking, and that's, what's exciting to me about this, Dan, is that it's so fledgling and there's not really a whole lot of things out there that are fledgling anymore. I mean, imagine when smartphones were fledgling, you know, the Blackberries, the Palm Trios. Yeah. And they were rickety and they were laggy and they were slow. You used a spin wheel to type on the thing, man. Yeah, exactly. But now, you know, it's, it's almost less exciting because now they do everything and it's hard to up the ante anymore. But I'll, I'll tell you what, the first time I put a movie 
on my Palm Trio and Velcroed it in my vehicle to my dashboard, and I'm driving down the street watching Batman Begins. Yeah, you hacked your phone, man. You yeah. hacked it into a TV. How how cool, right? How cool is that? And it was exciting. And now, shoot, man, I can watch whatever video I want on my phone or my tablet, and it's not near as exciting. So I, I think that's what really gets to the grinder community is that it's so new and it's really a pioneering type thing that, you know, there just aren't as many, I guess, topics or subjects or industries or whatever that you can get in on the ground floor on anymore. Yeah, I think we've been goofing on these people to a certain extent, but mm. it is true that these people will provide provide data that otherwise we would not have had and yeah. eventually we will have stuff that's reputable you know that comes right. from a google or a company like that that is a mass market product so what do you think the ultimate goal of biohacking is like if you, i mean if you were to take it to its to the nth degree what do you think the ultimate goal here is are we talking like like 50 years from now i'm talking indefinitely like indefinitely? what's the ultimate goal oh we're we're getting into deep stuff now mm -hmm. uh at that point, we have to go the whole like man and machine route, you know, that's very good. That's very getting good. to the point of like true full on cyborg. Mm -hmm. And you would just like, I don't want to die. So I'm going to replace this lung with a bionic lung because they can grow them now. Or I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be feeble and old. So I'm going to give myself new legs, new arms. And then, I mean, to the end, if you really want to take it to the end, you'd be uploading your brain into a computer. And at that point you have ceased to body hack and you have just hacked yourself into a computer. Exactly. That's exact. I mean, you hit it right on the head. So the ultimate goal of biohacking is to live forever. And there are people in these circles that believe that the first person to live to a thousand years old is already alive today. Yeah. And that we're going to be able to use this type of technology to map the brain to a computer uh, is one option. So option number one, you mentioned cyborg, is to take our consciousness and put it into a computer and then that machinery can live forever or replicate itself, right? That's option one. Option two is from a medical standpoint, some studies show that there are only seven things that age us. There's only seven, I guess, biological processes that age us. And there you know, have been experiments done with fruit flies where you take a fruit fly that normally lives 72 hours and they've gotten them by shutting off some of these to live for weeks. So from a biohacking standpoint, it's either we're going to either transfer our consciousness or we're going to stop the aging process. It's just, it's, it's crazy sci-fi stuff, but really looking at the, the biohacking and where it is today, these are the first steps. There are seven things, Aubrey Gray says there are seven things that age us that doctors and scientists can currently treat. He believes that the first person to live to a thousand years is already alive today. Pretty crazy. I want to live forever. Dan, do you want to live forever? I don't know if I want to live forever, but I, I, extra time's always good. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with you. A couple hundred years, I think, would be good. Yeah, there you go. I think you'd probably be vampire sick of time. It. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But then we get into, and this could take our our story into a whole different direction. But you get into yeah. a question of haves and haves not. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have a job that you know affords me the luxury to live forever, but you, you know, don't have a job or you have a low paying job. So sorry, you have to die like all of the common folk. Right. So, you know, you would have this weird class society. All right. So we talked a, a lot about, or a little bit about the business of biohacking, right? Yeah. And right now, 247wallstreet.com has the implant industry as a $200 billion industry annually. And these are the most common medical implants or medical biohacks that exist today. Just to kind of give us a platform of how common this really is. Where it's uncommon and where it's new is using the biohack or the implant for a non-medical reason, for a utility reason. But check this out. So a cardro defibrillator 
Basically, it monitors and treats heart rhythm through small electric pulses or electric shocks. Uh, so it's 133,262 of these are done every year. Artificial hips, 230,000. Pacemakers are number nine, 235,000. Breast implants, I thought breast implants would be higher on the list, to be honest, but 366,000. Now, is that pairs of breasts or is that each breast? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's pair. I think it's pair. So really, it would be higher. It would be 712,000 different breasts implant that were implanted. Spinal screws. So this includes any, you know, screws, rods, artificial disc, that type of thing. Anything that's implanted into your spine to fix it, 413,000. IUDs. This is related to birth control. Dan, do you know what an IUD is? Yeah, yeah. All right. And in the intrauterine device, 425,000. And then any metal screws, pins, plates, rods for any other bone fracture. So you, you break your wrist in a thousand places. My mom has some of these in her wrist from the time that she broke it. 453,000. Artificial knees, 543,000. Coronary stents. So these are tubes that keep your arteries and your heart open. 560,000 ear tubes. So this one's kind of interesting. Now we're getting in the top three, right? So we talked about the, the stents. Number two, ear tubes, 715,000. Ear tubes treat middle ear infections in children, but studies show that a third are unnecessary. And the amount of these that have been done is up 40% in the past decade. So any of you parents out there, if you go to your doctor and they seem to really, really quickly say that an ear tube implant needs to be done on your child, you may want to get a second opinion because it sounds like this has become such a simple to do procedure that it's become more of a business than a necessity. So one out of every three of these that gets done was not needed. Artificial eyes or lenses, so implants of these into the eye, 2.58 million. These are mostly due to cataracts and are also up 43% in the past decade due to the procedures becoming better and less invasive, that type of thing. 2.58 million, by far the largest type of implant on an annual basis is artificial eyes or lenses. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That's just a quick list of the top 10 implants that are done annually here. The 2.58 million, that's one out of every roughly 3,000 people. Somebody in your town mm -hmm. has had this. If you live in a small town, somebody's got new lenses in their yeah. eyeballs done this year. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But it just shows you, it proves how helpful this technology can be. So really, why not take it out of the medical and into the utility, entertainment, whatever, you know, why not since it's there and we're obviously seeing huge increases in the amount of implants that are being done effectively, easily, safely, and without complication. Again, I'll say we are not condoning this. Don't do it, blah, blah, blah. But why not, right? Why not um, have this become about more than just fixing people's medical ailments? And maybe, just maybe, the non-medical grinder community or the non-medical biohacking community will innovate in ways that could benefit the medical community. I would expect that to happen. You know, it's, it's like, I guess I, I liken it to all of the inventions that come out of war, right? Yeah. Yep. I see that. I think it is something that we'll see more of. I think that there's going to have to be a tipping point. I think we're going to have to get to that thing. Maybe it's glucose sensing contact lenses. Maybe it's mm -hmm a Bluetooth device, uh, something that lets you hear your phone that's implantable and very easy to use, or a Bluetooth that you just don't ever take out because it's so comfortable. Right, right. But at some point in time, we'll get to a tipping point. Yeah. Another one that's being done right now are LEDs implanted subderminally. See, I know you think this is cool. It is cool. This is dumb as hell. If you're that guy, you're the guy that has the monster tattoo. Yeah. If you have a tattoo of a monster energy drink and you're fighting with your buddy <laughs> who has a tattoo for Red Bull energy drink, you're both morons 
and you should get the LEDs put into your body. I don't get it, man. Uh, All this stuff, for the most part, sounds cool, but LEDs under the skin, like I'm going to bling my car out, and, and while I'm at it, some some sweet LEDs. Yeah, why not have the neon tubes under your car that match the LEDs under your skin, right? And then you said monster, and when I thought of first was someone who had a tattoo of an actual of a monster. monster. Yeah, no. and I thought of having little red LEDs under the monster's eyes that you could like light up with a magnet. So, you know, I've got a monster creature on my arm and then I just swipe this magnet and it turns on the LEDs and they like light up. LEDs. Yeah, but then you're talking about a novelty and I guess tattoos yeah. are a novelty right. already, but LED that's maybe that's just old man in me, but I feel like that's going too far. Yeah. But that's where I I agree, but that's where this is going and it's already a thing. It's going to be those people. It's going to be mm-hmm. those people with the actual monster tattoos. And it's gonna dude, check out my tattoo. Oh, is that the monster symbol? Yeah, it is. Check it out. I can make it glow green mm-hmm. if I stick a can of monster right next to it. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, one of the interesting things about grinders is that they view the body. This is an, an another Amo Grafstra quote, but they view the body as a sport utility vehicle, something that can be upgraded, something that can be added to, you know, you can take your SUV, you can get the big knobby tires and the KC lights on top to be able to see into the forest and shine for deer or whatever, you know, you can upgrade this thing. So why is the body any different? So I thought that was kind of interesting. It's, it's there, you know, a different value system than some people may have, but Again, there's something romantic about it almost. And I don't mean romantic like, ooh, uh, you're romantic. And no, I know what you mean. You know what I, mean it's, right? I, I think, again, the upgrading part of it could also get scary because that's, I've got a, you know, a 2017 bicep. My mm-hmm. bicep is from 2017. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's not working as well as it used to. I'm going to trade this puppy in, Mm -hmm. you know, at at that point in time. Again, we're talking about stuff that's inside you and you would feel pressure, you know, whether it's just or not. Like my friends got this cool new bicep that I should get. So it's just one other thing. And I'm just playing devil's advocate or angel's advocate, I guess. I don't know. But that is something that could come up as well. Dan, do you know what a Tamagotchi is? I remember Tamagotchis, yes. What's a, what's a Tamagotchi? So a Tamagotchi, it was that little egg thing that uh, you got when you were like early 90s. I think so. I think. Yeah. And it was a pet. It was a digital pet. And you had to feed that little bastard and play with him or he would die. Mm-hmm. And if he died, he stayed dead. Yeah. yeah. You had to keep your Tamagotchi happy. You did. And what happened, what Amo... Grafstra calls the Tamagotchi effect. What happened with a lot of these is they would die or, or it was it was neat for a while, but then it would quickly become boring and end up in junk drawers. And we're in a situation with some of the, the biohacking, the external biohacking stuff that we have now where it's becoming the same thing. I remember back to having a heart monitor at one of the places I worked at that you could buy where the heart monitor went around your midsection. And this was like one of the very first ones that came out. So, you know, today you can have your smartwatch read your heart rate, but people would actually buy this big strap with a heart rate monitor that would go around their midsection and that would read it. And I'm sure those are all in in junk drawers. And the reason is, is because a lot of the external biohacks require a lot of management for very little gain. So if I want to use my smartwatch to Bluetooth signal to unlock my door, I have to make sure the Bluetooth is on. I have to make sure that it's connected to the device. And then I've got to go into the app and then I've got to unlock the door. There's so much there. There's so much management that is required uh, with a lot of this stuff, which is why I think it's not taking off the way that businesses hoped that the wearables would take off. But if you can imagine having a little piece of rice implanted in your hand and it requires zero management, that's what another thing that's interesting about the biohacks is they require zero management. So you just walk up to the door and it just works. Yeah. 
You don't have to open up an app on your finger in order to get it to function. You just hold it up to the door and it reads it. Uh, and the other thing that's nice is if you compare it to things like different scanning technology that's all sci-fi, like a retinal scan or a fingerprint scan, you know, that, that technology, especially on doors, can be quite fragile. Could you imagine the glass lens required to effectively read your eyes to let you into a building or a door versus how tough you can make the technology that reads a, a short range radio frequency ID yeah. tag. So there, there's benefits to it from that standpoint as well, where it just requires so much less management than the different external biohacks that we have currently in the, in the wearable industry. And maybe at some point, the external stuff will, be, will have less management to it. But you know, even today, it just requires too much to use some of this stuff. Here's another interesting story. So let's let's get into our final topic, which is the concept of choice versus privacy, you know, that type of thing. One of the big concerns that people have is the move from or the, the fear of moving from this being a thing that you can have done by choice to something where you have to have it done. Yeah, it becomes like standard identification. Right. Exactly. And the whole mark of the beast, which we'll get into in a minute, is a big concern for Christians that believe in, in revelations, that type of thing. And we'll, we'll address that. But we were talking about the company in Sweden called Epic Center that is allowing by choice their employees to decide whether or not they want the RFID. And there are already videos out there falsifying that and saying that this company is requiring it of their employees. There are already people that are spin doctoring this up to create fear. But just so you know, team, there is no one, there is nothing, no organization out there that requires people to be chipped. Why am I bringing this up with so much anger. vehemence yeah. Yeah, or anger? I'm going to make you do it. Yeah, you're going to, other than Dan, who is going to make me do it, but you don't have to worry about it. All right. There was this hoax that came out by this website called nationalreport.net, which is a self-titled like the onion for politics, right? So they're self-proclaimed as being, uh, what's the word I'm looking satire. for? Satire. Yeah, satire. Thank you. Perfect. So they came out with a story saying that because of Obamacare and Hannah, Wyoming, they were requiring anyone getting government assistance to get chipped uh, if they were on welfare or getting food stamps or any type of assistance. Oh, so they, thanks, Obama. Yeah, and exactly. So they come out with this article that's complete satire. And what do you think your more crazier people in the media did with that story? Ran with it like Ran morons. With it. Ran with it like it was truth. So now what happens is this problem that we have especially on the internet where something starts off as being false and and publicly false but then it becomes true because it gets shared so many times and it gets put out there as true yeah if it's perceived as truth because you know fox news ran with it or cnn has done the same thing you know they all do it they see something interesting on the internet they don't want to be the last ones to report on it they jump on it without vetting it and then the next thing you know, you get a story about Obama slapping chips in people. Boom, that's it. And now you're reading the story about how the local churches are opposing it, and, and it creates this reality to it. But here's, here's what we really mean. If you look up on Google RFID, at least this is the way it was a couple of days ago, the second, the second link that comes up is this story, is this hoaxed or or satire story. So if people are listening to this podcast, oh, I'm interested in RFID. That sounds interesting. I at least want to learn about it. The and second highest thing that comes up is a hoax story. Right, exactly. So we just want to make sure that everyone out there understands and knows that this is not a requirement anywhere at all. No, this complete choice. And I don't honestly expect it to ever become a requirement. What's interesting is where this came from is uh, there are a group of individuals that did get chipped against their will, and these were pets. Yeah. So where this tech originated from were or was chipping your pets so that if you lose your pet, they can scan the chip at the vet and find out whose pet it is. But other than your pets... People 100% have a choice, except 
for the concern about parents. Now, there are some parents out there already that are chipping their kids without, you know, their kids' obvious maturity or consent. So they're creating this, you know, digital footprint or this way to communicate with the outside world or this biohack for kids without their choice. So that's a, another consideration is, I don't know, Dan, you're a, a father. I don't currently have any kids, but if I did, I probably wouldn't chip them. If I saw any real benefit in chipping my kid, if I thought that that was going to stop my kid from getting abducted or right. taken, then yeah, but it's an RFID chip. Yeah. So the idea that they have behind chipping their kid is my kid gets taken or gets lost and goes to a police station and they think to, oh, maybe he, nobody, no cop in the world is going to say, maybe this kid has an RFID chip. Let's right. scan him. Right. So nobody's ever going to know you're putting a chip not in today. your kid. Yeah, not today. Yeah, well, th that's the the flip side of it. If it catches on, it's like when we were kids. You remember when you were a little kid and you got your fingerprints taken? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the cops came in and it was just in case your kid ever gets uh, abducted. Yeah. We have his fingerprints on file. Again, when was the last time anybody came through and said, well, we found little Timmy all thanks to the fingerprints that we had on file. Right. No, they get your fingerprints on a file. And I will say for the record, I'm not like an anti-government wacko. Yeah. But right. I do think that that was a little bit of cleverness on our government's part by saying, hey, let's get these, uh, these fingerprints on file just in case. Mm -hmm. And now guess what? Your fingerprints are on file forever. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to be in a situation where if terrorism got really bad per se, because this is the guise in which I could see this happening. Terrorism gets super bad and they say, you know what? Terrorists can forge documents. You know what they can't forge? This crazy hexadecimal RFID chip mm -hmm. that we're going to have every American get. Every red, white, and blue American is going to get chip implanted in them. And that'll be your true identification. I would not want to see that ever. And I would, yeah. I would move. I, that would make me move. It would make you move today for sure. And it would make me move today. And not in an well. Alec Baldwin, like I'm going to Canada move. Like, yeah. No, I, I don't want to live in a country where that would be commonplace. And that's fair. What's interesting is how public opinion can sway over time. So I, you know, I can't say that we will never live in a society that will require it, but I don't expect us ever to live in a society that would require it without it being positive in the public's eye. So what do I mean by that? Think about how public opinion has swayed about various things, even over the past decade. Gay marriage, which I'm a huge fan of, allowing that for anyone right but yeah. the the overwhelming public opinion was against it you know a decade ago and now that is shifting same with uh the legalization or medical use of marijuana you know again public opinion is shifting 20 years ago 25 years ago if you would have said hey public opinion is going to start to sway in the positive of making marijuana legal people would have said you were nuts but i'll say it to to combat that, I guess, combat's a strong word, mm -hmm. but all of those things are giving rights. And that's what the Constitution's all about, giving us rights. The Bill of Rights, also about giving us rights. And when they started talking about, because, you know, when uh, George Bush was president, they were talking about making a constitutional amendment to prevent gay marriage. That's taking away a right. I never right. thought that the Constitution should be made to prevent rights from somebody. Yeah. and making people get tagged, I think there should be a constitutional amendment. If this does get big, if it gets commonplace, they should make a constitutional amendment that says we will never force Americans to be chipped against their will. An American has a right not to be chipped. Yeah. You can, I, think I think that's, that's a, I think that's a civil right. I think that's a human right, not just an American right. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a good comparison as far as giving rights versus taking some away or taking some liberty away or some freedom away. I think that's a great comparison. I also think there could come a time where public opinion sways enough to where people don't see it as a big deal, where their security, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Where their security concerns outweigh 
it, it, it happened after 9-11, you know, Patriot Act, whatever. People's security concerns outweighed their and that's concern what I'm over, saying. That's, over freedom. That's the point in which it could actually become something that people would consider. And I think it would mm-hmm. take a while. I think it would take a long time and it would take a protracted issue with terrorism or something else like that to do it. But that to me is just a government or a faction of government taking advantage of a bad thing in order to enforce status quo. Mm-hmm. Well, we want to know what your opinions are. So if you go to the website under episode two, we're going to have a few questions posted. And one of them will be about this idea of choice and privacy. You know, we talked about a few things here, like being able to use biohacks to advertise directly to you based on your biochemical responses to things, to images, to advertisements. But do you ever see yourself living or do you see the society ever getting to the point where people's concerns about their privacy are low enough to where they would accept countrywide chipping of everybody instead of social security cards. So instead of getting a social security card, you get a chip. Do you ever see us getting to that point? We're very interested in your thoughts and opinions there. Um, but another another thing we wanted to talk about regarding this is especially for the folks that really heavily are concerned about this being the mark of the beast. We wanted to talk about this for a minute. And specifically, this is what Revelation 13 says about the mark of the beast it causes all both small and great both rich and poor both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name and we all know that the number is 666 so that's the the mark of the beast Um, and there's some consequences to this as well Consequence, if anybody worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. So Bible says if you get the mark of the beast, you will be tormented forever and ever. But those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Is that very fair, do you think? Well, I kind of think the notion of it is BS, personally. Yeah. No offense to anyone that believes it. Anyone yeah. believes it. I, I just don't believe in it, personally. The fact that to avoid something and to say, No, I'm not going to take this. If this was the real deal, if the people that got chips were by and large evil Mm -hmm. and the people that didn't were by and large good, my, my question to that would be like, if you were the person that didn't get the chip, but you didn't do anything to stop anybody else from getting a chip, how would you deserve any benefit? over somebody who did get the chip? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you just avoid, no, that's not for me. But you right. go ahead and do it. Yeah. I think it I think it just speaks to, you know, sacrifice. So the thought is is that when the end of days comes, that people are going to have to sacrifice in order to, you know, not be tormented forever and ever. And for others who take the easy way out and get the mark, you know, they're gonna have an easier time while they're here, but then when the end comes, I think it I think it's just like anything else from the Bible, it's meant to teach us lessons. But, you know, as far as it being literal, I struggle because all you have to do to avoid it is get the mark on your left hand. Because it says quite specifically it either has to be on the forehead or the right hand. But if you're just like, hey, put it on my left hand, technically you're you're fine. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah, I think it's I think it's there's a lot of life lesson to be learned from that, but not a lot of, uh, of real concern. But again, you know, in the wonderful land of the internet, there are people out there that are already crying wolf and saying that these biohacks are in fact the mark of the beast, that everyone's going to have to get them sometime soon, that the end of days are coming and that 
this proves the ushering in of this, you know, they're fear mongering. So we just want to bring it up so that people judge for yourself, have your own opinion. If you think, in fact, this is signaling in or ushering in the end of days, again, feel free to post on the blog for episode two. We want to hear it. But we also want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to form their own opinion and that we aren't artificially causing people to be afraid. That's that. What have we talked about? We've covered a lot today. We had our little disclaimer at the beginning, do not do any of this. Then we went through the uh, history of biohacking, starting mostly medical implants and things like that, and moving into the different types. We talked about where you can get biohacking devices and kits today. We talked about how this is going to be a business and where the money can come from, specifically bio big data. We also talked about some of the liberty, freedom, and other concerns when it comes to privacy and choice. And ultimately, we want to know what your thoughts are on this subject. So we asked you some different questions that you can post your responses to, but we want to know what your thoughts about biohacking are. Is this something that after listening to this episode, maybe you're just a little bit more inclined to consider? Was it enough to make you run out and want to get this done? Do you see enough benefit there? Do you see it being something that maybe you would consider in the future, but the technology is not quite there? We want to know what your thoughts are on you personally getting, a, you know, your bio hacked, so to speak. So that's what we've got for you today, folks. Dan, what do you have? Well, if you liked what you heard today, we would appreciate a five-star review on iTunes. We're just starting out, and everything helps. If you have uh, questions or uh, comments, please direct them to either info at crushingdefeat.com, or you can leave comments under the blog section on our website. That's it. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This is the Crushing Defeat Podcast. My name is Blake Richards. With me is Dan Burrington. Goodbye. And we'll talk to you in episode three. Quick, 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 quick.